and he and I were talking about this ahead of time, and he said he was about to blow you guys away. So, fasten up your seatbelts, okay? Good evening to everybody. I've had three masses already, and I think the combined uh, combined uh, number of people in the churches were smaller than this. Every weekend I drive out to say mass at Strong Ranger in Eastland, in Cisco, out in West Texas. So uh, it's a great place to be. I enjoy it very much. Well, um, honestly speaking, how many how many guys here have ever thought about being a priest? It's a few hands. And how many how many ladies have thought about entering the religious life? Just to show our hands. It's not bad. That's not bad at all. Now, growing up, I have not been a Catholic my entire life. I grew up as an Episcopalian. My dad actually was an Episcopal priest, so I joke saying that by the time I was eight years old, I had probably been to more religious services than most people go to in their entire life. But I always liked it. I always enjoyed it. But I never, never pictured myself becoming an Episcopal priest. What's very interesting is looking back on my life and where I am now, there were little signs. When the thought floated through my mind of being a priest, it was always a Catholic priest. But in my mind, growing up, I always thought I was going to get married. Whenever I was an Episcopalian, I thought I was going to get married and have two kids. When I became Catholic, I thought I was going to get married and have at least five kids. You know, things, things changed. So. But, um, so, you know, I wasn't really thinking about the priesthood seriously. I grew up in southern Missouri. I was a choir nerd. I was in choirs in the pre-glee era of choirs, where basically... You were a big nerd and made fun of by everybody if you were in choir. But if you were in choir and made fun of by everybody, you bound together. So you kind of, it was you against the world. And now it seems to be cool to say, I don't know, I don't know what happened. <laughs> um, I am also older than the internet and cell phones. It's an amazing thing that happens to you. I have no Facebook page. I don't want to be on Twitter. But each of you will find one day some technology will pass over you. It will happen. And then when you have no idea how to use that technology, you will think you're cool. You will. You will be, you'll be old school at that point. So whenever you're, whenever you're old, whenever you're speaking to a group where you're more than twice the age of the people you're speaking to, wondering how in the world did this happen to me? Where did all this time go? Just remember Father Wallace, I will be in some rest home senile. <laughs> anyway, when I was 18 years old, um, I came down here to Texas. I came to TCU. Uh, about February of my senior year of high school, I wanted to go to Notre Dame, went up there, didn't work out. Still didn't know where I was going to school. My mom came in my room and said, hey, you know what? You're going to graduate in May, and I think it'd be a great idea if you knew where you were going. College. So I dumped out this big bag of mailers. It used to be that this truck with the little thing that said U.S. Postal Service would come by your house. I'm just kidding. It's, I think we all know what it is. But anyway, I got a whole lot of things from schools. And I was just going through them, through them, through them, and saw a TCU. And I looked, and at that time it had international political science. Awesome major. I'm going to TCU. Walked out, told my mom and dad, here's where I'm going. They looked at what it cost, and they said, how are we going to pay for it? And I said, I think God wants me to go there. So they said, how can we argue against that? <laughs> so at that time, it was about half the cost of it is now. I graduated with you know, a lot of debt, which now that I'm a priest, it was paid off, thank goodness. And, uh, but, but I went down there to study music, music education at TCU. So 1992, I show up there sat through many long afternoons of us just being slaughtered in football. Um, I, still, I still carry a 63 to three loss to A&M in my heart. But uh, I don't know about any UT fan, it was very, it was, a, it was a beautiful sight to watch TCU win on Thanksgiving in Austin. So, uh, but anytime I talk about football, I need to take off my collar because, uh, 
because I think when you talk about college football, you sort of enter an amoral realm where you can say what you want to say. Uh, and, uh, and, and I make an appointment for confession. <laughs> but I went through TCU just thinking, you know, dating, just sort of normal college life. Nothing extreme like St. Augustine, but, you know, not on the path of priesthood necessarily in my own mind or in my own thought. I did sing. I sang at St. Andrew's Episcopal Church, which was downtown. And when I first started singing there, your current pastor was just leaving the Episcopal Church. And I thought, Father Hart, you are such a sellout. You have got to stay in the fight of the Episcopal Church. But he was off. And that was in 1994. And through a lot of prayer, discernment, study, conversation, a lot of Episcopalians at that time were becoming Catholics. My own got to go visit England, and I thought it was going to be this awesome homecoming. And what I found were destroyed monasteries. And saying, you know, I grew up, I loved the Episcopal Church, and this is not the uh, Episcopal Church bashing session. But when you walk on the grounds of a disillusioned monastery and you read about how an abbot was killed and you know, all these other things. This just wasn't what I thought it was. And so God very slowly began to move my heart away from the Episcopal Church towards something else, towards the Catholic Church. Now I grew up in the generation of Pope John Paul II. And, and so this is a little bit hard, you know, it's I am so excited that we have a new pope, I really am. And at the exact same time, I still miss my first pope. <laughs> he still just lives in my heart. Like even before we were, we were not Catholics, but Pope John Paul II came to New York City and he, was, he said mass there in New York and he gave a blessing. So one of my first memories is my mom taking me and we knelt in front of the TV to receive a blessing from Pope John Paul II. Now, if that's not a Catholic thing to do, there is no Catholic thing that you can do. Thanks be to God, my mom is now a Catholic. My father, unfortunately, has passed away, but he became a Catholic too for his own death. So, so I'm wandering around here a little bit, but, but what really started to change my heart was the Eucharist. Now, in the Episcopal Church, I learned that it stayed bread and wine. It stayed bread and wine. But you received the grace of the body, uh, you know, of Jesus Christ. But I really, for the first time, was, was taught in conversation with Catholics that this is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. And that is or it isn't. And that teaching has been there since day one. There has been no development in that teaching in the church. It has always been that way. And so I began to think, if that is, that's either true or it's not. And if the church has always taught that, then it's either right or it's not. And if it's right, that's where I need to be. And if it's wrong, well then the Catholic Church isn't anything. But if it's wrong, how does the Catholic Church outlast all of these governments? How does it how does it endure for all of these times, generations, cultures, problems? How does it keep surviving through history if it's that wrong about its most central teaching? So little by little, my heart was changed, and I became, I became a Catholic. And then came the big question. You know, I started to think, well, what is it? What is it that God's asking me to do? I wish I had a clear sign. And so I didn't really have a sign. And, you know, I was interested in somebody, started to date a little, and it became very clear at that point, and I was very intentional that I didn't want anything to get weird with this dating, that it had to be very, very clear so I could discern clearly, and it just became crystal clear that God was pushing me towards the priesthood. But for me, it was just, it was just sliding that scale, like the, the, the it was just tipping very slowly. But one of the main tipping points for me was in 1999, whenever I got to go visit or <coughs> see Pope Paul II up in St. Louis. And he spoke to the youth in the Kiel Center, which is where they play hockey, 
But I didn't hear that speech. I just got to see him there at the mass. But whenever I got on the plane to come home, I was reading the newspaper and had his speech to the youth in there. And um, you know, if I choke up a little, it's because I'm tired. You know, usually I'm, you know, I'm pretty tough, at least in my own mind. <laughs> but what he said in there is he said, I personally ask you, if you're considering priesthood or the religious life, to follow your vocation courageously, that God will give you the strength to do what he asks you to do. And I was like, that's for me. The Pope asked me to follow my vocation courageously. And if Pope John Paul asks you to do something, you got to do it. <laughs> so, you know, I applied to the seminary and um, just started to, started to go in. That I was, by that time, by the time I entered, I was, in my own mind and heart, I was sure that God was calling me. Now, not everybody is. Not everybody is. And anybody on the seminary staff would tell you, don't think that way. So that's, I just kept it to myself. You know, I was sure I was going to make it. I was like, I'm not going to go through all this trouble. I remember sitting in my car before entering the seminary. Uh, it was down in San Antonio, there was a huge drought, everything was dead. It was probably the ugliest place on earth. And I was sitting in my car, ready to get out, and I could see the street in front of me, and I thought, this is it. I could just drive away and not even have to think about this, but if I get out, I'm going through. So it was kind of like me and God, and so I opened the door and I stepped out, you know, this way, out of the passenger side, you know, out of the driver's side got out. But all this simply to say, the, the main point that I want to convey to you is God calls you individually. There are no two calls that are alive. There were some times that I thanked God for his call, and there are other times that I haven't been really happy that he's called me. However, his gift of my vocation is something that I don't deserve at all. I don't deserve to be a priest. Um, you know, there, I am very well aware of my own limitations, and, but at the exact same time, there's sometimes conversations where, you know, it's not always easy to walk into a hospital room where tragedy is taking place. I'm like, okay, God, you called me, so just please help me to go in there and not say anything stupid. You know, that's... Uh, or at the same time, to be able to celebrate baptisms or celebrate the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. These are tremendous gifts that God calls. But God also calls you to the fight, so to speak, the spiritual fight. Um, so any vocation isn't just going to be, man, this is like the most awesome thing. Like every day is just like being at Disneyland. Um, there are real struggles. But it's only in struggles that there's actual growth. And the only real growth that we experience is the growth of St. John the Baptist. He must increase, and I must decrease. If I'm becoming more and more important every day of my life, in my own mind, I'm probably on the wrong path. But to be able to preach and to serve Jesus Christ, this is the, this is the greatest goal. But like I want to say, is if your first reaction to being called to be a priest is to say, please God, don't do that to me, that's probably healthy and normal. That was my own experience, and so I'm just justifying my own experience. <laughs> that's self-justification, that's it. But the fact of the matter is, is I experience again and again and again that God is smarter than me. That many times I have made an act of thanksgiving to say, Thank you, God, for not giving me my own way. Thank you for being smarter than me. And thank you that, that I was able to just say yes. Um, it, it is amazing, you know, what God will call you to. This is especially true for me. I grew up in a very small town in southern Missouri. And I was saying mass one time in Spanish in Clifton, Texas. It's like, God's humor in a way, like, how do you get a person from rural Missouri into Clifton, Texas, where I think the, neck, the, the biggest thing to Clifton is like a chicken processing place, and then like, I mean, you're kind of in the middle of nowhere out there, but God's own ability to call you individually, but 
begin to call you into the service of something greater than yourself. And that essentially is what I've found in the priesthood, is that the priesthood of Jesus Christ is ultimately service of him. But in so doing, you're really bound with so many other people, so many other times and generations. That's, you know, that's a very, very brief outline of my own story. And I don't know if there's a question or two that you might want to ask. If there's anybody with a question. I need to be more specific. I used to, uh, I got a degree in music education. So a student taught, I decided I did not want, I did not want to do that um, after four days. <laughs> <laughs> that makes your parents really happy with you. You know, <laughs> you decide to not do what you've uh, spent four years in school to do. Uh, but then, you know, for a little while, I worked at the sporting goods store, I worked at the Bass Performance Hall when it opened, I worked at a parish for a year and four during the seminary. But each and every experience has been used uh, along the way. You know, I learned in retail, I'm not good at retail because it's like, oh man, I feel bad because like we buy this stuff at one price and then we charge these people a little bit more. <laughs> I don't know what it really costs, but that's sort of like the whole foundation of, uh, of our economy. <laughs> but it, when it comes to kind of the spiritual side, I, I, I'm good with that. You know, I'm, I'm good with, with being able to offer, offer people that. Okay, so any questions? Because I want to make sure there's time for everybody else to speak to them. Well, right now I work as the director of catechesis. I've been ordained a priest for five years. I was three years at St. Matthew's in Arlington. I was ordained in the summer of 2007. Three years at St. Matthew's in Arlington. I was these last two years living in Rome, studying over there. And then I came back and I was working as the bishop's priest secretary. And then he told me on a Wednesday that I was switching jobs. And then he told me on a Friday that he was going to California. Um, <laughs> And so right now I'm the director of catechesis without a bishop. So basically I use my time studying what's going on in the diocese. Uh, because the church is very smart. She's very specific. When you don't have a diocese, they say that nothing changes. And so at, at, our, at the administrative level, that's what I'm doing right now. And then on the weekends, I go out to those four parishes, Strong Ridge, East, and Cisco. In my spare time, I sleep. <laughs> that's it. Okay, any other? Any other questions? The Rome without the H, yes, Rome, Italy, yeah. That's where I sort of felt they sent me to they sent me to study Italian in Assisi for five weeks, like walking around saying, "How did this happen?" You know, I don't. I lucked into this. I did not even talk to my other priest friends because I didn't want them coming over to beat me up. You know? <laughs> Because when they're back here working hard, I'm just trying to, you know, conjugate Italian verbs. So, <laughs> it was, it, it was very nice to be in Rome for these last five years, or two years. I was a singer. Uh, I was in choir. I was, I played the snare drum for four years in high school. I didn't really like it. I was in marching band. I only grew in the middle of high school, so the snare drum was bigger than me, and I was a weak you know, so. It was hard to march, but sing bass in the choir. That's what it, that was my, my main thing. Well, I'll break that up. Whenever I became a Catholic, they were both, they were, they took it hard. My dad took it as I was becoming a Catholic. Mom already knew I was going to be a priest. So there's just two of us, my sister and myself. So it was, it was hard on both of them. My dad came along pretty quickly, like basically by the second conversation. And then my mom, it took a little while longer. But uh, my dad, he was received the day before he passed away. Then my mom became Catholic a couple days later. So um, the longer she also moved to Wisconsin after this. Now in southern Missouri, 
if you become a, if you're a Catholic, or especially a Catholic priest, first off, you work for the Antichrist, and then it only gets worse from there. You know, <laughs> instantly, where I grew up. Well, then she moves to Wisconsin, and it's like instant celebrity. If your son's in the seminary in Wisconsin, my mom calls Catholic radio, she gets right on. You know, there's like a, 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 a so, so my mom now is more Catholic than I am. <laughs> So there's, been, so there's been a real grace of conversion, even in them. And that's what's really taught me that resistance is not necessarily a bad thing. It can be difficult. It can be very difficult to follow your vocation, but that doesn't mean that you don't have a vocation. And even people around you, staying faithful to what God calls you to do, can bring other people along. It, it can be a great grace for you know, an entire family, or even community. No, no, my sister. My sister is still. Uh, actually, though, her, my nephew, I got to baptize my nephew. He came down to visit me and wanted to become a Catholic. Now, what he said was um, he came down to visit whenever I was seven years old, and he had sat with the family at Mass, and he wasn't able to receive communion. And he asked me why and all this, and so he started, I started to talk to him. And at seven, he looked at me and he said, I don't want to be a normal kid. I want to be a Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> so, cool. so, yeah. so he's in Catholic school now. You know, he's, he's doing great. Uh, what are some of the courses you did for your, your first semester at the The very first thing I did was study pre, uh, pre-theology, which was philosophy. So I took all philosophy courses, like intro to philosophy and those things, because I, I had already had a bachelor's in music and then um, went on. I don't want to scare anybody, but what's been amazing is I was K through 12, I was in school for 13 years. And now since graduation, I've been in school for 13 and a half years. So the Catholic Church likes educated persons. This is one of our great strengths. If there's one more question, then we'll probably move on to the next. Did you struggle with anything before becoming a Catholic? Well, struggle kind of kind of three things. Purgatory, because growing up, purgatory seems a little bit arbitrary. But whenever I finally kind of through a lot of prayer and study figured out that you can't be perfect. No, you can't be in the presence of God in heaven until you're perfect. And how do you get to be perfect? And basically that gap can be purgatory. No, so it's fairly that one. Um, I always had a deep devotion for Mary, and once I understood the correct attitude and teachings of Mary that the church has, that became clear. And then the third was the Eucharist. So those were kind of like the three, the three things. And then from the flip side, just basically kind of moving an entire life in perspective where all your friends are one thing and you're kind of moving into a, a whole new, a whole new world of existence. But what I'd like to do is thank y'all very much for your time, attention, and please